Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to this uh, first colloquium of the 2021 uh, calendar year. Uh, happy to see you all. Uh, we have a record attendance, it looks like. Uh, and so today we are going to hear from uh, Dr. Uh, Esteban Araja. Uh, he came to Western in 2009 and he has been a faculty member here since. Uh, his research focuses on the study of massive star formation and the interstellar medium. He carries out observations at uh, radio frequencies with some of the most sophisticated radio telescopes uh, in the world. And uh, the story that you're going to hear about, uh, one of the most famous radio telescopes, the Arecibo, uh, he is member of the users group and he has used that uh, telescope for a uh, majority of his observations. So in some sense, you know, for the new year, we're usually happy. The story that you're going to hear today is a bittersweet story. You know, it's a, uh, it's a couple of recent happenings uh, towards the end of 2020 were quite saddening for the whole uh, research community, for the, the astronomers physicist, nat uh, no, National Science Foundation, uh, and so on. Uh, so it is uh, uh, this bittersweet story is what you're going to hear from Dr. Araja. And in that sense, it is in some sense a very historical uh, opportunity for all of you to get to hear uh, in some sense a firsthand account of the contributions of this tremendous telescope. So uh, uh, just to kind of introduce our speaker a little bit more, uh, he received his uh, bachelor's in physics from Universidad de Costa Rica, uh, and he did his master's in physics work at uh, the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan, Puerto Rico. That's where you need to go to visit Arecibo. Uh, Dr. Araja did his PhD work from New Mexico Tech uh, in um, New Mexico. And so it's really wonderful to have Dr. Araja as not just the uh, the colleague in the department, but also to hear from, uh, you know, the in, so to speak, the insider story of Arecibo. Uh, so Dr. Araja, thank you very much for agreeing to give this presentation and the floor is yours. All right, great. Thank you, Dr. Kapale. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. All right. Yes. Yeah, so thank you everyone for, for coming. As uh, Dr. Kapale mentioned, it's a uh, uh, bitter, bitter sweet. So I'll try to, uh, have my voice not breaking and, and some of the parts that I'll, 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 I'll be mentioning it. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a tribute to one of the most iconic scientific instruments ever built. That is, that is kind of our, our goal. Uh, Arecibo uh, was, uh, was plain amazing in lots of aspects, uh, just in the scale and right, in the size. So, so this is a, a more or less recent picture a couple of years ago of the telescope, uh, a dish, a thousand feet in diameter. Uh, this, this dome, uh, like, like a three-story building, this is here a museum, so you can compare like a, a big building with respect to the dome. A um, hundred feet here in the, in the, in the air, right? It's, it's, uh, it was, was, was plain huge, amazing, amazing telescope. Uh, how this came to be uh, and um, what happened? And uh, what were the, the, the contributions? There's so many contributions of this, of this telescope to the scientific community. Well, that's our goal today to, uh, to talk about those aspects of the, of the telescope. Uh, well, Puerto Rico, so here's our planet, right? Uh, so if you want to go to, to Arecibo, well, uh, so it's here the, the island in, in Puerto Rico, and then another of these pictures from, from a space. And there is something really shiny uh, that you can see here in the mountain regions of, uh, of Puerto Rico. And it's that, that dish, here's the, the dot. Uh, that one is the, the dish of the, of the Arecibo uh, telescope. Uh, so how came that to be? It's amazing, right? How can you think of building such a huge instrument? Well, uh, that was the, the, the dream uh, of Bill Gordon. Uh, and uh, at Cornell, and that in the 1950s, he thought on uh, the possibility of building a gigantic um, uh, radar uh, 
that it will have like a tower so you can put some receivers there and use this as a radar to study the ionosphere. Uh, not only for scientific reasons, but also, um, for instance, for uh, mil possible military applications, right? If you will have a, a missile coming from, from Russia, let's say, uh, and um, um, it could create some, some signatures that can be detected in the ionosphere. So, so then the, the um, uh, Air Force uh, got interested on the, on the idea and financed the project. Uh, where to build it. So they explore different places, but at the end it was, it was here. It was in this uh, 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 terrain, hilly terrain in Puerto Rico uh, caused by limestone that creates sinkho uh, sinkholes uh, because there is, a, there is a subterranean river here. And uh, you can barely, you see a little bit here of, of the shape of the place where the telescope was, um, was built was built relatively fast in a, in a few years. Uh, it, was, uh, it was constructed and then it was transferred from the military to the National Science Foundation uh, at the end of the 60s and controlled by NSF since then by different um, organizations, mostly Cornell uh, and finishing with the University of Central Florida. Well, uh, the, the place was there. However, it was of course not, not quite perfect. So it's, it's, this is an example of amazing engineering. Uh, so changing, modifying a huge area, right? To, to accommodate this scientific uh, instrument. And, um, and, and more than that, my goodness, the people working there and, and, and building the telescope for sure, uh, well, they could manage heights. Right. Uh, so here, some some picture uh, showing kind of the workers building the, the telescope. And one of the first things that um, was changed from the original uh, idea was that instead of having a central tower, um, the idea was to have a platform um, uh, is shown here where you could have the receivers. And the idea there is that you could actually uh, point the receivers at a different direction and then the telescope won't be looking just only up but also at different angles. And that will make it far more uh, versatile. And that is what they, what they did. So, so here are uh, some pictures here when it was uh, uh, dedicated in November 1st, uh, uh, 1963, almost 60 years ago. Um, the, the original uh, surface was actually um, not much different than, than, than chicken, uh, chicken wire kind of thing. Uh, so you can actually see through and see the, the surface here, uh, like the ground. Uh, and then the, one of the first uh, upgrades was to uh, replace the surface with uh, aluminum plates and that will allow observations at uh, higher frequencies. Yep, so this is actually a, a picture uh, when they were working on that upgrade in the, in the late, um, yeah, in the 70s. And uh, yeah, basically just putting uh, aluminum plates all over and with that the, the surface will be better to reflect higher, higher frequencies. Um, the telescope is actually in principle not that different than a telescope that you can buy in Walmart for, for, for kids, right? It's a reflecting telescope. Uh, the only difference is that it reflects uh, microwaves instead of um, optical light. And uh, however, the shape is, is uh, it was, was, was curious because the usual telescopes, they have a parabolic shape. A receiver had a spherical uh, shape. And the idea there, uh, for those of you kind of taking optics, is that if you have a parabolic shape, then when the light comes, uh, then uh, gets uh, uh, reflected into a point, the focal point, right? And that is if you have a parabolic, a parabolic uh, mirror. If you have a spherical one, instead of having a focal point, you, what you have is a focal length. And that is actually quite useful because uh, you don't have to move the telescope the dish, you can actually move uh, where you are receiving and you will have different focal lanes and then you will be able to detect information at the different angles. So this is an example here of uh, one of the receivers that would have been looking at an object that is not directly up, but at an angle, right? That was, that was the idea. Now, uh, the, the problem with this is that these receivers, these antennas, these line feeds, uh, have to be designed precisely for the frequency or wavelength that you want to, to observe, right? So they were really sensitive, they were great. However, they will work only for very specific frequencies and that was quite limiting. So then the second big upgrade of the telescope happened in the late 1990s when uh, the idea was to continue using optics. 
uh, instead of um, uh, using just line feeds like this that will work for a specific frequencies, the idea was to uh, lift this huge dome uh, to the surface there, to the, to the platform there. And um, the idea was the following. Uh, so in this uh, um, dome, you will have a secondary reflector or mirror, a tertiary reflector or mirror, and then the electromagnetic radiation comes, reflects off the surface of the telescope, enters, uh, reflects in the secondary, then reflects in the tertiary to a point, to a focal point, where you can actually put receivers and, uh, and then you, you're not constrained by the specific frequency you want to observe. You, you can build receivers that are white uh, frequencies and you can observe lots of things um, simultaneously, or you can actually rotate between different receivers to detect uh, different types of frequencies. So this was the big change that happened in the 1990s together with new receivers. Um, and that was the time when I, um, when, when I started my work at, at Arecibo. So this is uh, probably one of the first pictures that I took of the telescope uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and you can see that uh, it's kind of shiny here. Of course, it was not a digital picture, right? Uh, and uh, this is a picture of um, uh, when, I, when I was observing uh, back then. So, um, yep, yep, yep. So this is kind of fun, right? You, you remember the old cameras, not the digital ones, the, the old cameras, uh, the fancy ones uh, used to type the, or have the dates, right, printed there, which is actually kind of nice because then, then you will know when, when the pictures was uh, taken. So yeah, 20 years ago, um, my wife said that I look very different now. Uh, I disagree, uh, but well, whatever. So here uh, I'm, I'm observing, this is the control room of the telescope. So, so this dome, you can see it uh, through these this windows here and this um, is my, was my, my, my advisor uh, back then. All right, so those years, uh, this is actually uh, one of the first digital pictures I took of the telescope. So yeah, after I improved my, my camera there, upgraded my camera. Uh, so between the, the 2000s to, to uh, last, the middle of last year, uh, they were great, great years uh, for, the, for the telescopes, lots of discoveries, lots of community outreach, new receivers, new ideas, new developments, uh, very vibrant, uh, vibrant uh, lots of challenges as well. But, um, but yeah, it was, it was what, amazing uh, 20 years. And um, because there were new ideas and, and new things happening. For instance, uh, uh, in, the, in the late 2000s, uh, the, a new receiver was uh, installed in the telescope called Alpha uh, that had seven, seven beams. You can kind of see it here. So inside here is where the, where the receivers are at the focal point. And uh, so basically, instead of having a singular receiver with these seven beams, you, you, you had basically like seven telescopes, seven receivers working at the same time. It was, it was quite quite amazing, uh, and with this, uh, people were able to study things like pulsars. Uh, that is the remnant when a star dies; uh, it leaves a very compact object, or pulsars, and um, hydrogen in our galaxy and other galaxies. Quite a bit of uh, very amazing research happening there. Uh, another thing that uh, this upgrade allowed was uh, to observe uh, using this radar idea at higher frequencies uh, so that one could image uh, asteroids, for instance. And uh, this is a really nice example. So this is the discovery of the first triple asteroid uh, 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 near Earth. So, so asteroids are small things. Uh, one could never thought that asteroids could have moons. And our receiver showed that uh, asteroids could actually have little asteroid moons, so quite, quite amazing. Uh, but more, more important than this is that with just a few observations with our receiver, you can get the distances to these uh, asteroids so precise that you will know uh, the future of the orbits. And you will know whether these asteroids will collide with Earth or, or not. Uh, unique instrument. There was there is no other way of doing it. Um, uh, and not only that, so other lots and lots and lots of other results. This is one of my favorites, uh, but of course I'm biased because it's one of my my discoveries. So we we discover um, uh, uh, flares of uh, organic molecules in uh, in space that uh, for for some reason they will the the organic molecules will form aldehyde. 
right? You may remember from biology or chemistry, uh, will get really bright and then really dim. Uh, and we discovered that that, um, uh, those, the, that molecule can show this type of flares. And uh, this discovery was started with Arecibo, um, was a combination of telescopes later on that we continue using, but certainly the Arecibo data because of the sensitivity was unique for the type of work that, um, that, 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 we, have, that we, we, we have done with um, uh, in this area, right? Um, and, and so there's kind of uh, the, the, a little bit of flavor of things that were going on in the last 20 years, but uh, quite a bit of uh, development. So, so this one, for instance, you see these kind of uh, antennas here. This is called the um, Arecibo Observatory Hearing Facility. And the idea was to modify Earth's ionosphere. So send electromagnetic radiation to the ionosphere and, and, and heat it up. And then you study uh, what is happening uh, when, when electromagnetic radiation interacts with that plasma. Uh, uh, again, this was uh, from a couple of years ago, just uh, when, when this was really used quite a bit. Um, more, more things in the last uh, 10 years or so, uh, the nanograph uh, project uh, uh, started using Arecibo. And the idea there, as I will mention later, was to use um, pulsars to uh, detect gravitational waves. Uh, and, uh, and the idea is so, so interesting, fascinating, promising that uh, NSF just last September, a few months ago, uh, awarded close to a million dollars to uh, improve the receivers uh, of the dome uh, to uh, continue this this really promising uh, uh, project. This is September 2020, like not long ago. Um, and other uh, projects or other uh, receivers were in, in were being built. So this one is called the Alpaca receiver that uh, was was being developed, and they just uh, they got um, almost six million dollars in 2018 to develop this this uh, receiver there. So so our receiver. Um, was vibrant, was really bright, vibrant. Um, now, as uh, uh, Dr. Capale mentioned, I have been a member of the uh, user, user, user group. And, um, and also there is a, a specific kind of committee of the telescope called the users committee. And I was member there uh, uh, some years ago. And um, in this um, user committee, so let me kind of uh, let go, go back uh, for a minute here. Um, we basically analyze the uh, the status of the telescope, right? And um, in in and from that, it was uh, it was clear, right, that the telescope had lots and lots and lots of promises, uh, just like uh, like this one. Just to give you an example, so this one is from uh, uh, a press release of Western, right, in 2019, when uh, I had a graduate student, Jake, and an undergraduate student, Natalie, uh, visiting Arecibo, right? And here they are from the view from the control room, looking at the at the dome. And here uh, we are up there at the at the platform, uh, looking in this direction to the, the catwalk. You see here the, the the museum, right, and the catwalk here. Quite amazing. The the data we obtained uh, in that run is spectacular. The best data um, of for that uh, specific transition that has been obtained. And we just actually just that two weeks ago or so, Natalie was presenting a, a talk about our, our, our observations at the American Astronomical Society meeting that just just happened. So so again, kind of the data from Arecibo is spectacular, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and yeah, so from the user community, uh, we, we knew uh, the, the power of the, of the telescope. But um, back then, I was uh, in the, uh, the user community and committee where you have, we actually have to kind of write a report on the status of the telescope and recommendations. Uh, uh, this is an example of the report that, uh, that we submitted in 2012, right? And after a visit to the observatory and talking to the, the engineers and everything, uh, it was uh, clear, we were informed that the platform had uh, uh, issues with the weight. So, um, so the, 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 the telescope was not originally designed to have this dome. Uh, and when it when the dome was built, additional cables were were put here to to secure the structure. Uh, however, the the platform had issues with uh, with excessive weight. That uh, back then, if if I remember correctly, the what the engineers would, uh, told us was that it was not um, 
uh, a danger to the telescope itself, but more like uh, a limitation for the type of instrumentation and performance uh, of the instrument, right? So it was recognized as a problem uh, that the that the telescope that the telescope had. Um, and then some unfortunate se sequence of events happened. Um, unclear exactly what was the worst, uh, but in in uh, in 2017. There was a, a huge hurricane, Maria, that passed through the island of Puerto Rico. The eye crossed the, the location of the telescope uh, and, and uh, damaged the, uh, the telescope, but it was not a catastrophic damage. It was some damage, but um, actually the, the telescope was able to get into operation. And this is 2017. Uh, we were observing there in 2019. Right, so 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 the telescope was still it, it survived this this uh, huge hurricane. Uh, but then, between uh, December 2019 and 2020, uh, so here's uh, yeah, so 2020 here, there were multiple earthquakes happening near Puerto Rico. Uh, so of the order of 3,000 earthquakes of magnitude 2.5 or more uh, at the late 2019 and early 2020. Well, uh, this uh, information, by the way, is from the from the NSF town hall, also the American Astronomical Society meeting that, uh, that Natalie gave the, the talk. So maybe uh, the hurricane um, created additional uh, tension. Maybe these uh, earthquakes, maybe 60 years of um, of weather, tropical weather, um, and uh, or maybe uh, some problem with the with the construction. Uh, when the additional cables were installed. But in uh, August 10, uh, 2020, 3 a.m., uh, one of the uh, auxiliary cables uh, that was holding the, the platform came out of the socket. So the cable didn't break. You just uh, went out of the of the socket, and of course it fell, and of course it, it broke uh, a bit of the of the dish. Not a big deal, but the dish the dish is huge, right? And in fixing those the, this type of problems is, is not an issue, right? But the issue was uh, the the platform lost uh, some support there, and um, and this was unexpected. This should not have happened based on uh, the the parameters of tension in those those cables. So the National Science Foundation uh, developed a, a model right on, on the uh, structure, identify safety zones. Uh, they removed the socket and sent it to NASA Kennedy Lab for forensics uh, that was sent in, in early October last year. And then they, they work on a plan uh, to stabilize the platform and have uh, everything was approved by the end of September, right? So this happened between August and September. Right, and uh, they approve around ten million dollars for the stabilization of the telescope and order additional cables uh, that had to be especially manufactured in Germany, and the idea was to have them installed in early December. Well, um, the problem, the, yeah, the, the thing that we didn't quite expect was that one of the main cables so not the the auxiliary cables that were installed in 2020 in, in the early in the late 1990s but the, the original ones one of the uh, of those cables uh, uh, cracked and, and, and broke right so so there were four of these cables and you can see one one missing here right so one of the of the cables uh, broke on November 6 uh, uh, 2020 right? And this was this was um, this was unexpected, based on uh, the engineering uh, uh, um, parameters or no knowledge of the cables that shouldn't have happened. Um, so kind of how it is. This is a nice diagram from uh, published in Science a couple of weeks ago. So here, kind of the socket. This is from where the first cable kind of got loose, right? Uh, but one of the main cables. This is the one that uh, that snapped, right? And, and this one just just fell. Uh, a cable is uh, not only not a solid kind of cable. It has a bunch of uh, steel wires, uh, and uh, and there was supposed to be a system to pass air, dry air, through the cables to to basically remove the moisture and, and keep the corrosion out. Uh, but again, these cables have been there for 60, almost 60 years, and uh, this system to prevent corrosion apparently was not being used um, consistently. All right, so um, 
So nothing. The result is that one of those cables broke in November. Uh, again, it fell. It fell uh, on the dish. Uh, it made some damage in the dish, but again, not a big deal because the dish is huge and, uh, and fixing the dish is not a problem. Just to give you an idea of a scale, right? Take a look. This is actually a road. You can you can drive here. Uh, and in fact, let me show you here. This is a picture of Natalie uh, that uh, we were kind of going down here in a, in a, in a truck. And uh, yeah, we're under the under the dish back back then, and um, yeah. So so the National Science Foundation then um, when this um, this happened they had already kind of the, the restricted zone, so they they recognized that there was significant danger, particularly in Tower Eight, where the, the cables uh, two cables have have, have broken, and. Um, well, basically, there were these restrictive zones. The that museum, the visitor center, is here. The uh, observe room, uh, observing room here, with all the the data are right and the computers, all the stuff uh, is uh, here, right? And uh, and nothing. So there was a, a analysis done, uh, kind of uh, immediately. So the the cables fail below the expected capacity. So so basically, those cables shouldn't have uh, failed. That they they did and basically when this happened it was completely unclear the status of the other cables right uh, NSF commissioned three engineering uh, firms to analyze the, the system and model all the strength the forces and everything and they two of them concluded that uh, given how uncertain was the status of the other cables uh, they recommended um, um, control uh, the commissioning of the of the telescope really 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 uh, Sad and problematic news, but um, but it was it was unpredictable. In um, in nothing, uh, just a couple of weeks later, uh, the but it was expected after the breaking of the second cable uh, happened. This is the cover of Science, one of the most important journals uh, about science, right in the in the world. Uh, the the cover of Science this January was um, give it or some tribute to 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 our CEO. And yeah, on December 1st, 2020, the, the, the platform um, collapsed and crashed um, onto, onto the dish. So, um, so this is a, a nice diagram here from, from that uh, uh, article in Science. So again, kind of here, the different towers, uh, Tower 4, where the two cables broke, right? And then, uh, yeah, the engineering firm said, well, if another of the cables of Tower 4 were to break, that was it. Uh, the complete uh, sy uh, system will collapse. And, uh, and nothing, that's what happened. One of the cables broke, and an additional one. Then the other cable broke. This behaved like a pendulum and uh, crashed onto the uh, side of the, of the mountain. Uh, the other cables broke. The tip of the towers also broke. Uh, most of the dish, again, remained there, but again, the, the the important part is to have those receivers up here. That is the hard part. The dish part is not the the the, the, the problematic issue. Yes, yes. So 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 yeah. So this I'm going to show you a video. Um, is um, uh, not fun to show, but I, I think it's quite impressive. So I'm, I'm going to do it. Uh, just a question, Dr. Capale, can you hear sound? No? All it's, right. it's very low, very low. It's very low, but you were able to hear yeah. some? I heard something, yeah. All right, so let me kind of go back. I'm not sure if I optimize. Dr. Dr. Araja, are you sharing the computer audio? Uh, let, me, let me double check that one uh, just to see. Because I may not be sharing the audio. Yeah, all right. Okay, so let me let me try. Okay, so yeah, so this is the video from the close to the control room. Uh, this is that tower uh, four. Kind of the tips of the of the um, towers right that, that broke. 
So yeah, so that was uh, seven, well, almost 8 a.m. Um, December 1st. So apparently people could hear from, from miles away, right, uh, the, at the sound of the, yeah, of the collapse. Yeah, truly, truly, truly sad. Um, thank goodness the, the, well, okay, so here is the view from a drone. Here you see the cable breaking. First cable gone, second cable. The other one hold it for a little bit, but it was too much. And uh, the complete platform, again, just behaved like a pendulum uh, and crash on the side of the telescope, on, of, the, of the dish. Um, the tip of this tower fell, thank goodness it fell in this direction in between the, the museum and the uh, control room. So there was there was some damage in the at the visitor center, but um, was not major. And the control room where all the data and the computers are uh, was uh, was was fine. You can see the dish is, is almost all there, right? So so the dish was not destroyed, but the but the platform, of course, was completely was completely destroyed. Um, let me go back. Yes, so um, yeah, so nothing, I mean, really, really sad. Uh, but this is almost 60 years of amazing highlights, amazing work of this, uh, of this telescope in so many areas that I, there is no way that I can tell you in, in, in that more or less 20 minutes I have left. As so things from the study of the ionosphere to the, st the study of organic molecules in the universe, right, this has been Truly, truly amazing. Let me just give you a few um, highlights of the work uh, that has happened with Arecibo. And again, one of the most amazing and fundamental and unique, there is no other instrument on earth that is able to do this now, right? Uh, is the uh, planetary radar. Uh, there are planetary, there are radars, uh, but nothing as powerful as Arecibo. And, and a, a nice example of the power of this is, for instance, this one. So if you take a look at a planet like Venus, uh, then the atmosphere is really thick, mostly made of carbon dioxide. So the study of a planet like, like Venus is a great connection to uh, global climate change, for instance. Uh, but there is so much uh, material in that atmosphere that you cannot study it in optical wavelengths. There's no way. Uh, instead, what you can use is microwaves. And we use in microwaves, you can pass through the clouds and get the signal reflected radar, and then you can map the surface of the of the object. And that uh, has been done with, with Arecibo multiple times. So the idea is you have the telescope, you send the signal, a really powerful radar goes to the planet, you wait for the signal to come back, and then you can get an image of the surface of a planet that will be completely obscure uh, if you wouldn't use um, uh, radar using microwaves, right? So from here, we have learned that uh, of evidence of volcanism in uh, Venus, uh, uh, that it for sure is the cause of the thick carbon dioxide atmosphere that it has. Um, so from planetary science, of the first measurement of the rotation period of Venus, the same thing with the measurement, the first measurement of the rotation period of Mercury, a fundamental work in astronomy. But beyond that, um, something that is really nice about this planetary radar is that you send the signal, you, you wait for the signal to come back, so you can measure the time that it takes for the signal to go back, to go and come back, right? And if you know the speed of light, you can calculate the distance to the object really, really precisely. Uh, and then basically you have a, a great ruler using this. Uh, so good that uh, finally we were able to have a very good measurement of what an astronomical unit is. So by definition, an astronomical unit is the average distance between here and the sun. Uh, since the time of Kepler, uh, we knew the, the relative distance between the planets in astronomical units, but not the, the, the distance like in meters or in miles, right? There were some estimates based on eclipses and things like that, but it was with Arecibo that a, a very, a, a great measurement of what an astronomical unit is was, was, was obtained. So fundamental work in, uh, in astronomy and another understanding of the size of the solar system, right? Let me give you another example, pulsars. Um, 
Well, uh, this one is uh, the famous Crab Nebula. So the Chinese astronomers a thousand years ago uh, saw a star exploding there. And with Arecibo, a few years after the discovery of pulsars, Arecibo found um, um, a pulsar, an object in the very center of this uh, uh, explosion that was shining uh, radio signals every 33 milliseconds. Uh, and the the periodicity was, was really, really, really precise, right? And really, really, really stable. Uh, and this led to the understanding uh, that uh, uh, pulsars, those radio flashes, uh, are caused by neutron stars, um, the, the, the remnant of the explosion of a star of the size of a city and the density of the nucleus of an atom uh, that are spinning really fast with really intense magnetic fields that sh uh, shine this, this uh, uh, sort of flashes of microwaves. So fundamental understanding in, in stellar evolution. But more than that, with radar, you can get a really great ruler. With these guys, with pulsars, you get really good clock. So, so these are precise natural clocks in, this, in the sky for us to use. We physicists, we need tools to measure things. We need tools to measure distances like radar. And we need tools to measure time. And these pulsars are like perfect clocks. And that opened a bunch of possibilities. Um, for instance, exoplanets. So uh, a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize was given for the detection of an exoplanet around a normal star. Before that, the first exoplanet, the first planet detected outside of the solar system was detected with the Arecibo Observatory by Alexander uh, Wolskan and Dale Frail from the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. He, he was my supervisor for some years. And um, yeah, what, what um, Alex Wolskan uh, found was uh, that around a pulsar, there was a planetary system. Not only one planet, uh, but a, a system of planets, one smaller than Mercury, a couple larger than Earth, and all of and, and these guys closer than Venus is to our sun. A planetary system. Uh, and uh, in, in this is actually kind of nice. It's a, 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 a postal stamp right? That shows Alex Wolskan and Nicolas Copernicus, also two uh, uh, people from Poland, right? And uh, Copernicus, you may remember, uh, he basically rediscovered the idea of having the sun at the center of the solar system. And uh, Alex Wolskan is showing that there were other solar systems, right? Quite, quite nice. Um, all right. Using these pulsars as clocks have opened another view into uh, gravitational waves. Uh, and this one was a discovery that happened in 1974 by Hulse and Taylor. They used a receivo to observe a pulsar, and it turns out that this pulsar was in a binary system with another neutron star. Uh, and if in classical mechanics, if you have two things orbiting each other, they will orbit each other forever if there are no, if there is no friction, right? However, um, Einstein predicted in the theory of general relativity that if you will have two objects orbiting each other, uh, they will lose kinetic energy. They will lose their, their uh, uh, a, a potential energy in that one, in that orbit. And uh, some of that energy will be radiated outwards in the way of gravitational waves. So the orbits should, should basically um, decay. And uh, here are the measurements we've done with our receivo and the line is, is not a, it's not a fit, it's, it's the prediction from general relativity. So the, 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 the observations perfectly validated general relativity, the prediction of gravitational waves. Hulse and Taylor that discover indirectly gravitational waves and uh, for that they received the Nobel Prize in 1993. Fundamental understanding of uh, physics, right, of our universe. And um, more than that, a few years later, uh, millisecond pulsars were discovered uh, in a, a paper that actually one of my uh, uh, PhD uh, co-advisors, um, uh, uh, Miller uh, uh, Goss, uh, was, was co-author of that one. They discovered these uh, pulsars that were, are even better clocks. Uh, and with that, uh, around 10 years ago, is that this project, the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, was created. Now it is um, a National Science Foundation uh, Physics Frontier Center. And the idea 
was to use these pulsars that are across our galaxy as clocks. And then every time that you have gravitational waves passing the galaxy, then uh, the distance between the pulsars and us will start changing. And you can measure that. Uh, and based on that, you can detect these uh, gravitational waves, at least in a statistical uh, sense. Uh, quite amazing. And uh, this was based on using the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia, but mostly Arecibo that will give the sensitivity for the project. Uh, they are in the process of analyzing uh, data. So they may actually have the signature of the gravitational waves. This is using the complete galaxy as a telescope, right? The complete galaxy is a telescope, it's, it's, it's amazing. Ah, but uh, among all the other things, public engagement, I think is a, a truly a highlight of, of, uh, of RSEO. Not only documentaries, if you, maybe you're old enough to remember Cosmos, right? Carl Sagan, I truly love that one. I was a little kid when I, when I watched that, that documentary. Uh, and I do remember uh, them showing images of, of RSEO. Uh, since then, there have been lots and lots of documentaries, right? Okay, that's for people that like documentaries, but also in the general public. So uh, the, the, uh, one of the uh, James Bond uh, movies, right, uh, was in part filmed in Arecibo. So here's kind of uh, uh, James Bond saving the world and fighting the bad guys on top of the, of the dish of the, of the telescope. Uh, or another great uh, uh, example of a really lovely picture, uh, uh, motion picture uh, contact with Judy Foster. Uh, and here you see the, the dome of the, of the telescope. It's a, a truly piece of art, this, this movie. Um, that again, kind of uh, connected with so millions, millions of people, right? What uh, was happening there at, at Arecibo. And, and that connection between, between public engagement uh, in another area, that is called SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, uh, is, is, I think, one of, the, again, of the highlights of the telescope. Uh, so again, SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Uh, we haven't detected um, intelligent uh, emissions, right? Intelligence from, from aliens, right, uh, um, yet. Uh, there may be in the data obtained with our receivable. In the data that, for instance, Natalie is analyzing, there could be signatures of uh, intelligence uh, uh, emission, right? But if we don't, it's, it's hard to know how to look for it. It's, it's, there's so much data there and, and we're not looking at the data in all possible ways. So it's, it's perfectly possible that some amazing discoveries are there. We haven't just seen them yet because we are not asking the correct questions based on the data on hand. But, but having this uh, connection to public engagement, in 1974, the most powerful beam of uh, radiation was sent intentionally from Earth to this cluster of stars, M13, 21,000 uh, light years away, sending a message based on prime numbers, uh, telling any alien that will know about astronomy, radio astronomy, in this cluster of hundreds of thousands of stars that we know how to count binary, uh, that we know a little bit about atomic physics, uh, that our biology is based on the DNA molecule, uh, that we come from the third planet in a solar system, and that we know how to create these huge, huge machines to study the universe. So more than that, in the early days of the internet, uh, people working at Arecibo with this connection to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence uh, develop a great idea. It's called SETI at home. Some of you may, may have heard or may have even installed it in your computers. So and the idea there was to actually create the most powerful supercomputer available kind of back then, right? And it was uh, that in your computer at home, while you're not doing anything, you can have a screensaver that instead of just moving a fish or doing something that is not terribly useful, was using resources of the computer to look through the receivable data for um, signals from extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, nothing has been detected yet, but this was such a nice idea, connecting the people with the science in a useful way, right? Um, that from there, the, this idea of citizen science has exploded, right? And there is citizen science now for, from genomics to lots of areas, right? A, a, a great idea, again, from, from the Arecibo Observatory. 
So it's, is this the end of Arecibo? All right, so, so I will say, I will say no. And, um, and it's not only kind of wishful thinking, this uh, from the town hall that uh, just happened at the, at the uh, American Astronomical Society, the division director uh, of NSF, or the Astronomical Sciences, uh, was mentioning that, or reminding everyone that the observatory is not closed. So, so Arecibo, the Arecibo Observatory is not only the, the telescope, of course, that was the most important uh, facility uh, of the observatory, but um, they have uh, other facilities there. They, um, there is a 12 meter telescope that I'm actually part of a, a proposal to see if uh, we can we can use that that, that telescope, uh, the visitor center there. But most importantly, those 60 years of data, uh, those archives, right? That again, I mean, even in my own observations, right? We have lots of things unpublished, and things that we have published, we haven't seen them in all possible uh, ways. So this. There could be lots of interesting discoveries already in the huge data uh, sets of Arecibo. And the NSF plans to uh, use community input to, to move forward, right? And that is not just like NSF, the National Science Foundation kind of wants to, uh, is mandated now by Congress. So the, this is a copy of the omnibus uh, uh, bill approved by Congress in December to keep the federal government uh, operational. And they had a little section about our receivable. Uh, and for instance, they, they, they are asking the National Science Foundation uh, to establish a process to determine whether um, you can establish a comparable technology at the site, right? And what will be the cost of that? So, so there is some political will or a awareness, right? Of, um, of the need uh, to, to, to see uh, well, how to move forward. Um, even before this, uh, the, there are projects that are in the planning and, uh, and that they are moving forward, right? Uh, and the next generation very large array is, uh, is one of them. So the next generation a very large array is an extension of the very large array telescope in New Mexico uh, that before this, this sat, uh, occurrence, right, of the of demise of the telescope, uh, the idea was to have a stations in the Arecibo site. These are, these are, uh, this doesn't need the, the Arecibo telescope. These are different telescopes, right? Uh, they're completely new design, completely different. So, so, so the, the observatory will continue operating, certainly uh, as part of um, uh, the next generation very large array that I'm, I'm almost certain, sure yeah, it should uh, continue being um, developed. And I think they are gonna get funding and they will uh, probably start construction by the end of this decade. Um, but after this, uh, this, this happened, the, the scientific community, uh, well, we, we, we have been uh, moving forward. This is an uh, article uh, submitted to the National Science Foundation, it's called a white paper, uh, was submitted at the end of uh, last year, uh, December 31st, and a large uh, group of scientists all over the world, including a Western Illinois University, um, um, Proposing, right? Moving the ideas forward. What to do next? How to move uh, the science forward uh, with with um, uh, Arecibo 2.0, with the next generation Arecibo. And one of the ideas that we proposed in this uh, in this paper uh, is kind of not not building a, a new dish that is exactly the same thing, right? But um, but kind of having a completely different design uh, where you have uh, multiple dishes. So this is an example of. Uh, uh, communication and planetary radar in Crimea. And, uh, and the idea is uh, to have uh, a structure uh, where instead of a single dish, you have thousands of around nine meter dishes and uh, not mounted in a sphere, but in a plane. Uh, and it has lots of advantages of doing it this way. Uh, and then you tilt the complete thing to point at different uh, directions. And this is great for, for radar you can put lots of power now and emit a really powerful radar for this type of studies. Uh, you, it's beneficial for radio astronomy. It's great for ionospheric science. So it's a great ideas. Uh, it, challenging, just imagine 300 meters and you, the complete thing you have to move, right? It's engineering will be amazing. And maybe it has to be cut in sections, right? But, but these are kind of dreaming big and moving things forward, just like a receiver was a huge idea, right? In, 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 and, and it happened. Um, now, uh, in this, this brings me to perhaps the most important of all the highlights of 60 years of RSC, and this is the inspiration 
for generations of young scientists and engineers. Um, yeah, not only myself, 20 years ago, uh, one generation myself with my advisor, two generations, uh, but now uh, grad students and undergrad students uh, from Western and many other universities, right? So that would be three generations. Uh, even my students were uh, supervising and helping high school students using a receiver remotely. So maybe you can count maybe four generations or so. Uh, and here I am also, uh, let's see, 20 years ago with the advisor of my advisor, oops. Sorry about that. Here with the advisor of, uh, of my advisor, so five generations uh, here at, at Arecibo. So I was uh, kind of younger back then. Uh, and, uh, and that is uh, just a little example of the hundreds of uh, thousands of people that have been inspired, that have visited, that have trained that one way directly or indirectly have um, benefited from this amazing, amazing instrument. So to finish, uh, I will cite uh, words from uh, Bill Gordon, again, the one who, who thought on building a receiver, right? If you, if you dream, have big dreams. Uh, and, uh, and, and these 60 years have shown us that uh, big dreams can come a reality. And this is certainly a trailblazer for inspiring lots of other people to continue with, with big things. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Raja, for the wonderful presentation and giving us the inside story of Arecibo. It's sad as well as uh, humbling in some sense uh, about the contributions that the telescope and the, the uh, connected scientific community made and added to our understanding of not just uh, astronomy, but also you know, physics, uh, uh, so to speak. So let's open up the floor for questions. Please feel free to write your questions in the chat window. And as they come about, I will uh, uh, recite them and we will give Dr. Araja uh, to answer them. I guess you could also feel free to unmute yourself if you can and ask your question if you. Okay, so we have a question from one of our former colleague. Uh, if Arecibo was the only transmitting telescope. Yeah, no, it's not. So um, go, um, uh, uh, NASA has another facility, right? Oh, there are several other other radars and, and and of course those are the ones that we know the military may have uh, uh, classified radars but certainly nothing as big as a receivable because it will show up in satellite images right so, uh, so Goldstone is uh, one of the radars that uh, that can be used um, however again like nothing that nothing like a receivable so so this one we're talking about the difference and or the magnitude, right, in, in the uh, capability of, of uh, emitting the radiation. And also the, the dish is so big that implies that the beam or the area in the sky that you can see is very narrow. Uh, and therefore you can focus better the signal into the object that you want to shine, uh, the radiation to be able to study. This, uh, these new ideas, right, of, for instance, uh, the, the, uh, the next generation are receivable, uh, could be useful not only to study asteroids that could collide with Earth later on, but um, of course, it could have quite a bit of um, applications uh, that are in the military, right? And uh, basically, you can you can do radar of things in the in the low Earth orbit, or most most importantly, in geosynchronous orbit, right? Uh, I I think there is quite a bit of controversy on whether and a next generation of receivers should have a direct contribution from the military, just like a receiver was built, right? Or whether, no, it has to be completely a civilian. I, I think, um, yeah, there's quite con controversy within the, the astronomical community, I think. Um, but yeah, there are other radars, but nothing like pow that's powerful. Uh, you cannot study the moons of Jupiter uh, with any other instrument. Uh, you cannot do it. Water was first detected in Mercury with with, uh, with a receiver using radar, and you cannot do it anywhere else. Tracking those asteroids, you cannot do it anywhere else. 
Uh, we have uh, one more question and it is from one of our current undergraduates. How much of the data from Arecibo has been analyzed? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, you know, it's kind of fun. It's a, a great question because uh, I remember when I was a student, I asked precisely that question to a uh, one of the staff scientists. It was not of RSC, it was of the very large array, and uh, and he said like, I don't know, maybe what five percent or so. I don't know. So, so I'm gonna give you the same answer. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, easily up, up to some point, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, the order of yeah, maybe 50, 50% 50 or so at, uh, at a first look of something larger than that, now published will be far less than that, maybe 10% yeah, or some, some fraction kind of like that. But again, um, it, the way that you analyze the data, you you analyze it based on a question, right? You have a question you try to answer and then you, you think on a way of looking at the data to answer that question. If you don't ask the correct question, you may miss something interesting there, right? Uh, and there could be some very interesting uh, discoveries there that, that again, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen. So yeah, it's quite a bit of information there. Uh, we have a question from one of our graduate students, and I think in some sense you answered that. So I will uh, speak that question and then I add a, a, a component from my side. Uh, the question was, uh, when are we getting Aristibo back? Any hope on that? So I would kind of modify that question a little bit and ask you that the white paper that uh, you were a part of uh, to, put in, to put together on the next generation of Aristibo, what would be the timeline on, on that uh, that you think will is practical yes uh well all depends it, it, yeah there are so many variables there right so let's let's put it like this um a recibo was built uh since uh, uh bill gordon had the idea to to completion uh within 10 years or so right so so that is that is fast uh and once you have the money uh then you can you can do it really fast so so it's kind of as simple as as this if um, there would be political will or uh, those applications so, uh, from the military, right? Uh, it, there would be uh, the will of doing it. That's something like a next generation receiver could be completed in less than 10 years, right? Uh, it, it significantly even less, right? Um, again, for the military, building, rebuilding a receiver are pennies, right? Um, now, if it is a completely uh, civilian, civilian facility, like, um, like yeah, managed by the National Science Foundation, then it kind of depends. Uh, if there is um, a support from, um, uh, from the political system, right, then uh, it, could, it could happen again within times the scales of, of uh, 10 years, maybe 15 years, something like that, just like the Green Bank Telescope. So in the Green Bank, something similar Kind of happen. A hundred meter telescope collapsed in the nineties, right? Same story. I'm kind of unexpected. It was an old telescope and it was supposed to just be operational for 10 years and lasted for 40 years or something like that, right? And then collapsed. And um, uh, Congress, uh, Congressman uh, was able to basically secure the funds and rebuild a far better the Greenberg telescope, an excellent telescope, uh, state of the art, right? Uh, so Kind of like that. Now, if there is no political will, uh, then this idea will have to be in the queue of uh, the complete scientific community asking for what, are, what is the next step, right? And that is uh, called, as part of something called the, uh, the Cadal survey uh, that happens in astrophysics. And uh, the next generation very large array, for instance, was proposed for the uh, first decadal, uh, the decadal survey 10 years ago. I think the first ideas were mentioned. And certainly for this decadal survey, um, many papers uh, uh, pointed out, and now it is beginning quite a bit of funding for, for developing, uh, the, uh, developing the ideas and everything. So that one is wide, well uh, in the line, right? So, um, so if there is no political uh, input, uh, then the receiver will be behind that line, right? So we, we're talking about more like a couple of decades or something like that. So um, yeah, that's, that's the time scale. It just depends. Okay. 
Uh, we have uh, one more related question to that, and it's from one of our uh, alumni graduate student, Tim Woodworth. Uh, so happy to see Tim. Uh, so the question is, what are the advantages of using one big dish instead of a very large array of dishes? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so and that is kind of the reason why uh, in that uh, white paper that uh, was submitted to the National Science Foundation, uh, the, the community is, uh, is asking for having many small dishes instead of, um, of a big one. Uh, the idea is um, okay. There, are, there are lots. There are lots of ideas uh, or, or reasons why. If you have a single dish, then the area of the sky that is accessible is really narrow. It's really small. So if you have a bunch of small dishes, the area of the sky that you have accessible instantaneously, you just point up and look, is larger. Okay. So you you have more access, more collect more data, uh, while keeping the resolution. The, the angular resolution, uh, that one. Uh, from a planetary point of view, is actually easier to have lots of radar uh, transmitters, right, in the in the different small dishes than in a huge one. In a huge one, you have to pass lots of power right through a, a, a single kind of pipe, right, to get to that to the to the meter and then send the signal, right. So so you have lots of other problems. In the other one, you can uh, distribute that power. Right, and then the, the the technological difficulties to have a really powerful uh, radar are, are less. Um, so 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 those are those are some of the many uh, of the many reasons uh, why having a collection of small dishes is is better. Now, in the case of the next generation very large array, the idea is to have uh, also dishes, but distributed of the complete um, uh, continent. Uh, will be quite complementary to uh, the idea of having a, a, a receiver 2.0 because uh, the if you have dishes that are separated, then you actually are blind to certain structures in the sky. And it has to do with interferometry. Uh, but, but basically, if you have just a telescope that are separated, you don't recover what is happening in the sky completely. And you need telescopes that are really, really close together, like this idea. So. Um, so it's, it's, that's something actually kind of nice. So um, if, if it can happen, it would be complementary to the next generation, uh, very large array, uh, and, uh, and, and will complete with quite a bit of, of uh, areas of research that yeah, cannot be done with uh, single dish, for instance. OK, wonderful. Any more questions? Uh, please type them up or uh, speak those out. OK. Well, I would like to invite all of you to unmute your microphones and we'll give a big round of applause to Dr. Araja for this wonderful presentation. Uh, Alaric, you have a question? No, I'm just waiting to be able to give my applause. Okay, <laughs> very good. So let's, let's do that now. Unmute yourself and let's do the... Thank you. Wonderful.